What's up guys, BC Amplified. This is Monday Night Raw Review Reaction from Monday, October 2nd, 2017. Uh, who would have thought, man, how did this happen, right? This was Roman Reigns, Enzo Amore, and Jason Jordan getting cheered last night when they all started off getting booed. What a good night for Vince McMahon. I'm going to get to all that in just a few minutes. I want to start start off with the women. Sasha Banks, Bailey taking on Emma and Alicia Fox. This was a match that was in the middle of the third hour. But Sasha Banks still went out there and bled for this match. That's how much she loves this business. Whether it's the middle of Raw or a house show, Sasha Banks is going out there and giving it her all. And she's going to make everyone she's in there with look good. Sasha Banks can have a match with a bowl of Cocoa Puffs. And after the match, the bowl of Cocoa Puffs will be a star because of Sasha Banks. That's how good she is. And Bailey ends up winning this match with a Bailey to belly to Alicia Fox. Bailey's music is playing afterwards and Sasha Banks is looking like the like the lost puppy best friend behind her. You're like, yeah, whatever Bailey does, I'm going to do. And Bailey's music is playing and Bailey looks like the cool friend and Sasha Banks looks like the friend that's always there to pump up the ego of the best friend. You know what I mean? Like it's the other way around, man. Sasha is the cool one. Bailey should be lucky she's even in the same ring as Sasha. And every time they're in the same ring together, Bailey's getting the music, Bailey's got the spotlight, Sasha's always doing what Bailey's doing. It reminds me like back in the day, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. Whenever they were in the same ring together, Vince would always have Hulk Hogan's music playing. And Hogan would be doing the ear, the hand to the ear, the posing with the muscles, and Ultimate Warrior would always try to do the same thing with Hulk. And it looked so awkward, and you could tell like Ultimate Warrior was trying to kiss his ass so fucking much. Um... Which I don't think was the case, but I think Warrior was just uncomfortable. Like, this isn't my music. This isn't, like, my nothing. Like, I'll just do what Hulk is doing. So that's basically what they're doing with Sasha and Bailey now. Bailey's music playing. Bailey's doing the little thing to the crowd with her hands. And Sasha's trying to do it. What the fuck, man? That's a, Sasha Banks' music should be playing. Sasha strutting around that ring like she owns it. Because she does. And Bailey should be in awe of Sasha. Bottom line. Anyway, that was the match. Bailey and Sasha stay relevant because they're going to have their horsewomen versus horsewomen feud after TLC. So they got to keep them winning matches and relevant. And uh, so I, I, it makes sense that they're keeping them together, Sasha and Bailey, until after TLC and tag matches. And then on the side, uh, not just that, guys, and not just the Mickey James slash Nia Jax slash Alexa Bliss little storyline that they have going, which I'll get to in a minute. But aside from those two things that they have going for the women... At the end of the match, Alicia Fox went to make a tag to Emma, but Emma jumped off the apron. Emma was basically saying, I don't need you. I don't need this. I'm better than all of this. And Alicia Fox was left there for dead, and she got the belly to belly and got pinned. So this leads some friction between Alicia and Emma, and that could start something between them two. Now, normally, I'd agree with you guys. Why should we give a shit about Emma and Alicia Fox? Makes no sense. Nobody gives a damn. But I'm happy that they're actually implementing all the women and not just in one storyline anymore. So you have Bailey and Sasha doing their thing. You have Mickey James, Nia, and Alexa in their thing. And now you're starting something with even Alicia and Emma. That's cool, man. You have multiple things going on with the women. So that's good. And if they do it the right way, this could actually be intriguing between Alicia Fox and Emma. I think they have some charisma, definitely. Um, and I have, I think they have something there. If they give them enough time and a cool storyline, Emma and Alicia Fox could be something cool. And Mickey James, Mickey James, Mickey James. What can you say about Mickey James? Like a fine wine, she just gets better with age. And I'm not just talking talent, but what a pretty girl too, with a body like damn. I mean, this, uh, honestly, what is she? Like, late thirties, right? 37, I think even 38. And her, I mean, just in every way, shape, and form, this woman just keeps getting better and better. And uh, I, it's so cool to see her in another championship spotlighted match at, for TLC because that match was made official last night. Mickey James versus Alexa Bliss. Last night, Mickey James was looking for Alexa Bliss back in the locker room. Uh, but when she got to Alexa's locker room, she bumped into Nia Jax, who opened the door. And Alexa Bliss squeaks underneath Nia Jax and makes a match between Mickey and Nia Jax. Um, bad match. Mickey and Nia just don't gel well together. Um, but Nia Jax pretty much dominated the match. Mickey James is short and scrappy, so she got under Nia a lot and some scrappy punches, uh, kicks, uh, a jab here and there, but it was mostly Nia Jax. When it was all said and done, though, Nia Jax was flat on her back in the middle of the ring, and Mickey James 
took out Alexa Bliss outside of the ring. So it was Mickey James that was standing tall and telling both ladies, telling the champion, Alexa, who was down on the mat outside, and Nia Jax inside the ring, she was telling them both, I'm going to be seven-time women's champion. So Mickey James owned the segment, owned the night for the women there. And uh, that pretty much tells me that Mickey James will not be winning the championship from Alexa Bliss at TLC. But again, it's cool to at least see her relevant again and in these, uh, you know, top top of the line storylines for the women. Uh, it's just cool to see Mickey James back in there when just a few weeks ago they had nothing for her, not even backstage segments on TV. And now here she is about to have a title match. Um, so obviously this is just to get that title belt over to the Asuka feud for Alexa Bliss. Again, I thought it would have been Nia Jax because that's what Vince uh, initially wanted. But maybe they are going Alexa Bliss with this. It looks that way. And uh, it looks like they just needed somebody to get it over to Asuka. And it's going to be Mickey James that will be the next feud in a few weeks at TLC. So again, really cool to see Mickey James um, relevant again, man. And looking damn good being relevant again. Jason Jordan and Matt Hardy taking on Gallows and Anderson. Gallows and Anderson pick up a W here. All right, now they finally give Gallows and Anderson a W. It's about fucking time. I've been saying they should get Ws for the last year. And now you have them finally pick up a W. Um, this is only because Vince wants Jason Jordan to keep losing, guys. Um, that That's obvious here, and, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But first of all, you got to feel bad for Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy loses Jeff Hardy, unfortunately, due to injury. Matt Hardy tweets out, this is the time to get woken. Matt Hardy probably has all these ideas going through his head, like now is the time to push me as a huge single star. I can do it, Vince. Give me the chance. And Vince is like, yeah, we just want you to give Jason Jordan the rub. And for the past few weeks, and for probably for the weeks uh, ahead going forward, you're going to see Matt Hardy tagging up with Jason Jordan because Vince really wants Jason to get some rub cheers. And it worked last night. Denver was cheering Matt Hardy and Jason Jordan. Now, was most of that for Matt Hardy? Most likely. But Jason Jordan being part of that for the casual fan, they're starting to see, oh, wow, we can cheer for him? So Jason Jordan now is getting that rub. Um, and again, you got to feel bad for Matt Hardy. And again, they lost because Vince McMahon is, is making Jason Jordan lose all of his matches because they don't want to make the same mistake they made with Roman Reigns and have Reigns win all these matches um, only for fans to be like, no, they're shoving him down our throats. So they're doing the opposite with Jordan. He loses against Roman Reigns. He loses against John Cena. He loses against The Miz at the pay-per-view. He loses a tag match with Matt Hardy against Gallows and Anderson. They want you to see, like, he's losing all these matches, but he's showing his pride. He's showing his fight. He's showing his determination. He's earning our respect. Brilliantly played by Vince McMahon because I've seen last night in Denver, Colorado, it's actually working. I personally can give a shit about Jason Jordan right now. I think he has so much more he has to improve before I even give a damn about him. But again, it worked. If nothing else, from the casual fan to some of the smart fans in attendance, uh, it's working. And Matt Hardy and Jason Jordan got a response. But it was Gallows and Anderson that picked up a big time W. And they better keep up with this momentum. Not this shitty WWE, WWE illogical booking where they win one week and then they lose the next week. And then momentum for two weeks and then they lose three weeks. This give a little, pull back. Give a little, pull back. You can't do that. We've seen that with Rusev. We've seen that with Baron Corbin in your basic, and, and even Bray Wyatt. And you're killing these characters and individuals. Give Gallows and Anderson the time of day, finally. Speaking of Bray Wyatt, by the way, how about that Finn Balor-Bray Wyatt segment? Balor's in the ring cutting one of his Club Bella interviews and promos. Not even interview, promo. My apologies. Club Bella, his promo's going off. And um, there's uh, like every second I'm like, make this stop. Finally, Bray Wyatt comes up on the Tron. Bray Wyatt's talking about, no, you don't make the demon. The demon made you. And in our next match, I want the demon back. So now we went from Bray calling out the demon and losing to the demon to then Bray calling out just the man and then losing to just the man, Finn Balor. And now he wants the demon back. Well, you already lost against the demon. So what, what are we really... We're just... We're playing fucking hot potato with a match that in a feud that pe nobody gives a shit about. Until now... Because Bray Wyatt added an interesting little fucking... He's dangling a little piece of fruit in front of all of us. 
and he's saying that Sister Abigail is still alive. And he basically called out another match for, for him and Finn Balor. This will be at TLC. And now he's calling out he wants the demon. So it looks like the demon will take on Bray Wyatt's demon side of him. Because Bray says he also has a demon. Now, is Sister Abigail Bray Wyatt? Is Bray Wyatt just like, does he become Sister Abigail? Is that his demon? Or is Sister Abigail an actual person? Could it be Victoria coming back? Could it be a Nikki Cross from NXT? What about Say? She tweeted something last night that was interesting. What Could it be a repackaged page? My girl Jen over on Twitter. She had an interesting side note. Don't think it would actually happen, but it would be fun as hell. AJ Lee, right? Could you imagine AJ Lee playing the role of Sister Abigail? Obviously, again, I don't think WWE would pull the trigger on that. And I don't think AJ Lee is anywhere close to actually making her return. But that would be such a cool character for someone like her and Paige. If Paige was to come back repackaged as Sister Abigail, take my money. I'm fucking sold. But it's intriguing now. If nothing else, not just Bray and Finn Balor, Demon Bray versus Demon Balor. That's somewhat intriguing. But Sister Abigail is alive? which is what Bray said last night, who could this be if it is somebody? Or is Bray Wyatt just going to play the role of Sister Abigail as well? Is that his demon? I don't think so. I think Sister Abigail is somebody, and that's his demon. His demon is external. His demon is going to be by his side at TLC. We just got to find out who the hell it is. That's intriguing as fuck. And then it was time for all of us to walk with Elias. Elias Sampson just keeps improving and getting better and better every week, and I'm loving it. You remember when Elias started just a few months ago, guys? He looked uncomfortable. His songs made no sense. He was not full throttle heel. He was a heel, but he wasn't trying to get a reaction, or maybe he didn't know how to get a real reaction from the crowd. Um, it was just people could take it or leave it with Elias. Nowadays... He's hitting every crowd he's in front of hard. He's digging at him, calling Denver the worst city he's ever been in, like he does every week with every city he's in. Um, and he's trying to just get every boo and every you suck that he can from every person in attendance. And it doesn't look forced. That's the best part. You know Vince and Creative is telling him, all right, do this, do this. But it looks natural. It looks like he's comfortable when he's singing these songs and when he's delivering these lines in his facial expressions, his mannerisms. It looks real. Doesn't look forced and he looks comfortable. That's badass. That's why I'm starting to really like Elias. And it's going to be cool to see him moving forward as he gets even better and better because he's still, still so young in his career. Um, and he took out, uh, who was it, Titus O'Neil last night in a match. After the match, Apollo Crews comes in to try to save Titus because Elias was standing over him. Can somebody tell me what Apollo Crews is doing? Just his whole career. Go ahead, I'll wait. What is Apollo Crews' whole purpose on the WWE main roster? Why did you catapult him so fast from NXT to the main roster? For what? Apollo is such a good guy. I'm not even talking about in the ring or in WWE. Outside of the ring. Outside of WWE. One of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet is Apollo Crews. So I want nothing but the best for him. But they have zero for him. And to be honest, aside from his awesome talent, the guy's got no charisma, he's nothing on the microphone, and he has no character. What is Apollo's character? Nothing. So you want him to go out there, have a match every now and again, and you want us to really care about him. You want us to invest in him when you didn't even take the time to invest in Apollo. You catapulted him to the main roster when all, all he had was some wrestling skills, which is basically all that the, the, a lot of the 205 Live, the Cruiserweights have. Just wrestling ability. A lot of them don't have the charisma or the mic skills or any true character to them. That's why that division flopped. And because you didn't, when all they have is wrestling, you didn't even let them go out and do their wrestling. You had them just do WWE wrestling, which is a little bit more flat. A lot less high octane, high volume, high flying maneuvers. So of course the Cruiserweight division was going to totally flop. But Apollo is nothing more than just a talented wrestler, and that's going to flop every single time in the WWE. Even AJ Styles has more dimensions to him, which is what made him AJ Styles. He wasn't just a phenomenal wrestler. He had character. He was actually better on the mic from the time he started down in TNA. 
You could tell he was getting better and better on that microphone. He had charisma. You believed in AJ Styles. Apollo Crews, man, if you were depending on just his wrestling and you had nothing for him, no storyline, no character, no dimension to him, then you are the reason he's flopping WWE. And now you're seeing that this guy is so far under the water right now that I don't know if he can be saved. How the fuck do you save Apollo Crews from here? Turning on Titus O'Neil? What is that going to do? We're still not going to give a damn. They're going to have to do something huge for Apollo Crews because this is one of the travesties in WWE because he's such a good person. He's got immense talent and he's got no fucking direction. That sucks. You want to talk cruiserweights that I just talked about? How about cruiserweights main eventing Raw for the second week in a row? Now, for the second week in a row, it was not a match that main evented Raw, but it was Enzo Amore running his mouth. And even though he was getting more booze as he came to the ring last night, it was during his promo in cutting a scathing fucking dialogue on every single cruiserweight member that came out to the ring after Enzo did, everyone starts cheering Enzo, and Enzo starts getting pops. And all of a sudden, Enzo is the face heel. He's the cool heel again, right? The bad guy that it's just cool to cheer. That's what Enzo is becoming in just his second week becoming full throttle heel. That's how over Enzo is going to be. You give it one, two months from now. Enzo is going to be so fucking over if they let him keep grabbing that microphone and being a full throttle heel. Enzo is going to be more over than he ever was with Cass in his whole fucking SAWFT fucking, you know, let's sing along with the audience type shit. No, he's going to be even more over. Because when a heel is cool, nothing can be more over than that. Trust me. And Enzo, man, they're giving him the main event spot two weeks in a row. They're giving him a live microphone. And they're letting him tear up everybody. That was fun. Enzo, I can't believe I'm saying this. Because this guy had so much heat back in the locker room that it actually trickled down into the audience. That live crowds even knew that Enzo was annoying and nobody wanted Enzo around. Until Enzo started being cool again. So, that's what happened last night, man. Enzo, main event, live mic, scathing fucking dialogue on everybody. Enzo's over already. It took him two weeks as a heel. And all of that locker room bullshit is all dead. Enzo is an elite heel and he's in the fucking cruiserweight division. What the fuck? How did this happen? And where is this going? Vince dedicating the main event spot to the cruiserweights. That's cool. It's been intriguing the last two weeks. But where do we go from here? Well, I know where he's going in the immediate future. Kalisto comes back. They make it this intriguing thing. Like, Kurt Angle comes out and says, Listen, you have an order saying all the cruiserweights cannot touch you, Enzo. And that is true. But that does not mean my newest signee. And the newest addition to the cruiserweight division. And the whole crowd is dead silent. We're thinking, could it be Hideo Atami? Finally? Atami is coming? Now it's suck he enters the cruiserweight division. But we already know the cruiserweight division, Vince has already flipped it. It's no longer just for awesome wrestling because Vince already killed that. The cruiserweight division is now going to a more entertainment type uh, way of doing things. So Hideo Atami would actually fit. Or somebody cool from down in NXT, we're thinking, right? No, it's Kalisto. Collectively, all of Denver, who was hot all night last night. Dude, Denver was on fire last night. Awesome crowd. Um, collectively, Denver and myself included, and I know anybody watching on TV, we all just fucking like, just gave a sigh of like depression. Kalisto was your big signee. And a lot of people were congratulating me because I said Kalisto should have been in that division going for the championship months ago. But I'm not happy about this, guys, because they're months too late. Kalisto should have been in that division months ago. Kalisto should have been champion right now for months. Because Kalisto is the identity of the Cruiserweight. When you think Cruiserweights, isn't Kalisto... I mean, wouldn't he be your poster child for that shit? And no, they, they kept Kalisto in the main roster for some stupid reason. But now, when you flip it over to a more entertainment-based way of doing things, now you bring in Kalisto? Kalisto isn't going to bring in asses to seats. Hideo versus Enzo, that would put asses in seats. Not Kalisto, man. It was just too late for me, guys. So I appreciate everyone congratulating me, but they're months too late. 
Kalisto and Enzo does nothing for me right now. But at least Enzo on the microphone was badass. And again, they're giving Enzo the main event spot two weeks in a row. They got big plans for Enzo Amore, it looks like. After he takes care of Kalisto, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from there. But the actual last segment of Raw revolved around Roman Reigns, right? In the Shield reunion. I'll get to that in a minute. But there was two matches involving Shield participants. It was Seth Rollins versus Braun Strowman last night. Um, Braun Strowman just teared up Seth Rollins. Uh, just, uh, yeah, just tore him up. Uh, to the point where uh, after one power slam, he went and did another one. After a second one, he went to leave, but then he came back, he delivered a third power slam. Braun Strowman, they, you know, they're just trying to build him back up after that devastating Brock Lesnar loss. At No Mercy, they're trying to build Braun up again, and they use Seth Rollins uh, at, at his expense. So, or, or Seth Rollins was used. Uh, what am I trying to say? Braun Strowman used Seth Rollins at his own expense. There you go. I spit it out. Um, and then afterwards, guys, you also had Dean Ambrose. Uh, who was Dean Ambrose? Did Dean Ambrose come out and, and try to fucking... Who was it? Fuck, how did it happen? I forgot how it happened, man. Shit, this video went so long, I forgot how it happened, guys. I apologize. Maybe it was the bar came out and attacked Seth Rollins after Braun Strowman did? I think that's what happened. I got it, guys. Braun Strowman went to leave. The bar comes out, actually, because I remember the visual. Braun was headed up the ramp, and the bar was coming down the ramp. So they go and attack Seth Rollins. And, of course, Dean Ambrose comes to the ring, but to no avail. The bar, Sheamus and Cesaro, totally take out Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. Annihilate them. And that's what happened later in the night. It was the Intercontinental Championship match. Roman Reigns versus The Miz. And can I just say, all of Denver in that, in that arena last night was on their feet that whole match. And the cheers for Roman Reigns was mind-boggling, guys. This guy is getting over. Vince McMahon is probably back there in his own room doing things that Vince McMahon does. He is happy as fuck. Because Roman Reigns is getting the cheers. This is two weeks in a row that I've started to see the cheers kind of overtake the booze. Roman Reigns is getting over. And this is before the Shield reunion. Can you imagine what that rub is going to do for Roman? Because you know Vince wants the Shield reunion to get a rub and put that rub over on Roman Reigns. It didn't work with The Rock. It didn't work with, uh, with anybody. You pick everybody, guys. It didn't work. John Cena, The Undertaker. Nobody was able to give... Roman Reigns, that real rub. But after the John Cena match, you started to see a little bit of the cheers. And then last night, man, they're prevalent. And you mix him with the shield. Those cheers are going to be off the wall. Roman Reigns is going to be over. I just hope this doesn't ruin this kind of heel vibe he's given off. And this, I don't give a shit about any of you. I'm doing what the big dog wants to do. And this is my yard, and I'm going to go out and do what I want. I hope that kind of heel way in him doesn't turn because the crowd is cheering for him now. And I hope he doesn't become cookie cutter. You know what I mean? I hope that doesn't happen because it's, it's happening, guys. The cheers are coming. That whole match, that crowd was on their feet with Roman chants and just electric. Um, and I, w I would not anticipate that for a Miz versus Roman Reigns match, but they were electric. Um, the end of that match, you saw, well, first of all, Roman Reigns took out at the beginning Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel. They were taken out from the beginning, taken to the back with injuries. So it was just Miz versus Roman. But the bar comes out. Why would the bar come out to take out Roman Reigns? Now, we know in the grand scheme of things, it's so the Shield can reunite. But storyline-wise, it makes zero sense. Why? Because he was once friends with Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins? But Sheamus and Cesaro come out, they totally annihilate Roman Reigns with The Miz. And afterwards, they actually did the Shield fist pump. So they were acting as if they were The Shield. Um, Roman Reigns was just had the shit beat out of him. Again, all that's going to do is get the crowd to cheer for you even more. In case in point, to prove that, when Roman Reigns was flat on his back and the, sheer fi the Shield fist pump was happening... The rain of booze across that arena was deafening. That shows you they wanted Roman to get up and kick ass. They wanted the Shield to come out. Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins and them to reunite. So Vince's plan is working. Much to the dismay of a lot of people, his plan is working. At the end of that Cruiserweight segment, 
with Enzo Amore and Kalisto. Kalisto took out Enzo Amore. We thought Raw was going to go off the air, but it cuts to the locker room. And Roman Reigns is sitting down. And Dean Ambrose enters frame. And Roman's just looking up at him. And then Roman stands up and looks at Dean. And then Roman turns to his left. His left, which will probably be your right. My left, your right, what is it? Well, it was Roman's left that he looked to. And there's Seth Rollins. So you have Dean Ambrose on one side, Seth Rollins on the other, Roman's in the middle. And they just give a nod. Like they all know what needs to be done. Next week, the official Shield reunion. But last night, they were all in the same frame. The seed was planted. We faded to black and Raw went off the air. That was Monday Night Raw. Guys, I thoroughly enjoyed the Raw. The whole show... Um, nothing exceptional happened, nothing that was over the top intriguing, but it was a decent show. I'm intrigued going forward where they go with Enzo Amore. I'm intrigued with where, where they put the shield next week and how they pull off this story. Uh, I'm intrigued to see what demon and sister Abigail, what sister Abigail, who it's going to be, what the, what the demon means for Bray Wyatt. Is he the demon? Is sister Abigail alive in the form of an actual person? Who is that going to be? Um, you know, superstar wise, I'm just interested to see where they go with Elias Sampson. Um, it's going to be intriguing, man. And I, I got to tell you, I liked Raw last night, man. Uh, again, nothing exceptional, but damn, um, Vince is just doing all this weird shit that A, doesn't make sense at first, but then you're like, all right, I'm kind of into this. Tell me more. You know, it's one of those type of deals. So guys, that was Raw last night. Uh, we go on to SmackDown tonight. Uh, we have, whatever the fuck do we have? It's their go-home show. All right, you have Hell in a Cell. I almost said Halloween Havoc. For you old-time WCW fans, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, I thought Halloween, it's October, and I almost said Halloween Havoc. Hell in a Cell is this Sunday. This is the go-home show. It's not if SmackDown is going to put on a good show. They have to bring it tonight. So we're going to be, it'll be interesting to see what they do tonight for SmackDown. I'm going to be back with you guys tomorrow for the SmackDown review reaction. Uh, hell has frozen over. Roman Reigns and Enzo getting a spotlight and even cheers. It's fucking happening, guys. Um, I'm going to go over, get some Starbucks. We're going to kick Tuesday's ass and I will see you guys tomorrow. For now, we'll check you later.